Welcome back to my inner sanctum. I am your hostess, Countess Elizabeth, mistress of the macabre. Wild animals are, for lack of a better term, unpredictable. But what happens if you take that wild animal in and try to raise it to more like a human? This is what one such woman did with a chimpanzee she named Travis. Today, my fiends, we're going to look into an incident where Travis became more ape than man and attacked a helpless woman. So, let us open the cage and greet this ape so we can explore our grotesque curiosity. Travis the Chimp was born near Festus, Missouri on October 21st, 1995 at Mike and Connie Braun Casey's compound, currently named the Missouri Chimpanzee Sanctuary. Sandy and Jerome Harold adopted Travis when he was three days old. They named the chimp for Sandy's favorite singer, Travis Tritt. The Heralds raised Travis at their home in Rock Rimmon Road in North Samford, section of Samford, Connecticut. Travis was the Herald's constant companion and would often accompany them to work and on their shopping excursions in town. The Heralds owned a towing company and Travis would pose for photos at the shop and ride around with the tow truck, his seat buckled as he wore a baseball shirt. Travis became well known in the town and had been known to greet police officers they would encounter when towing cars. Having grown up among people, Travis had been socialized to humans since birth. A neighbor said he used to play around and wrestle with Travis. He added the animal always knew when to stop and paid close attention to its owner. He listened better than my nephews, the neighbor remarked. Travis could open doors using keys, dress himself, water plants, feed hay to his owner's horses, eat at a table with the rest of the family, and drink wine from a stemmed glass. He was so fond of ice cream that he learned the schedules of passing ice cream trucks. He logged onto the computer to look at pictures, watched television using a remote control, and brushed his teeth using a water pick. He enjoyed watching baseball on television. Travis had also driven a car on a several occasions. In October 2003, Travis escaped from the Herald's car and held up traffic at a busy intersection and was on the loose for several hours. The incident began after a pedestrian threw something at the car that went through a partially open window and struck Travis while they were at a stoplight. Startled, Travis unbuckled his seatbelt, opened the car door, and chased the man, but did not catch him. When the police arrived, they lured the chimpanzee into the car several times, only to have Travis let himself out another door, and occasionally chase the officers around the car. The 2003 incident led to the passing of a Connecticut law, prohibiting people from keeping primates weighing more than 50 pounds or 23 kilograms as pets, and requiring the owners of exotic pets to apply for permits. The Connecticut Department of Environmental Protection, or the DEP, did not enforce the law on the Heralds because they had owned the 200 pound or 91 kilogram Travis for so long, and the DEP did not believe Travis posed a safety risk. Stanford's animal control officer was more concerned. After contacting primatologists, she spoke with Sandy, arguing that Travis was by now a fully sexualized adult and he had the strength of at least five men. That adult chimpanzees are known to be unpredictable and potentially violent, which is why all chimp actors are prepubescent, and that maintaining Travis for the duration of his five or six decade lifetime was not viable. Sandy seemed to pay an open mind to the officer's warning, but ultimately concluded that Travis had never exhibited even the slightest capacity for violence. In 2004, Sandy's husband, Jerome, died from cancer. This triggered Sandy to sit down and write a letter. She drafted it longhand and addressed it to a woman in Florida who ran a respected chimpanzee sanctuary. She lamented the death of her husband and her reluctance to give up Travis. Ultimately, she never mailed the letter. Charla Nash, a friend of Sandy and her then 12-year-old daughter, had lived itinerantly, at one point staying more than a year in a homeless shelter. Charla had taken odd jobs, picked up occasional yard work, and cleaned horse stalls. The reunion was mutually beneficial. Sandy invited Charla and her daughter to move in rent-free into the loft apartment that had once been Sue's, Sandy's daughter's. She gave Charla a job handling the towing dispatch and bookkeeping. Over time, the terms of Charla's employment blurred. Charla attended Sandy's lawn and would look in on Travis if Sandy was away. However, Sandy rarely was away. For four years, Travis never left home and Sandy only sporadically did, aside from compulsive shopping trips. She spent hundreds of thousands of dollars at stores like TJ Maxx and Marshalls, stuffing bags of clothes and dozens of plastic bins. She and Travis relegated themselves to the kitchen and the suite in the rear of the house. In early 2008, construction was underway on a gigantic new addition that Jerome had designed for Travis years earlier. Travis, by this point, no longer bore much physical resemblance to his former self. He was 14 years old, five feet tall, 240 pounds, and morbidly obese. His hairline had receded dramatically, and his center torso had gone gray. His face was black and wrinkled. His chest sagged, 
He spent the majority of his days snacking, watching TV, playing on the computer, and roaming the house. It was February 16th, 2009, and Sandy and Charla had just returned from a weekend at the Morgan Sun Casino. Before leaving, Sandy had taken Charla to get her hair colored and curled. Charla returned to Sandy's home around 3.40 p.m. Travis had left Sandy's home with Sandy's car keys and Nash came to get the chimp back in the house. Upon seeing Nash holding a Tickle Me Elmo, one of his favorite toys, Travis flew into a rage and attacked her. Travis, Sandy shouted. Travis, what are you doing? Travis, stop. Travis, it's Charlotte, Travis. Travis knocked her into the side of the car, then to the ground. Almost immediately, Charlotte turned red with blood. Sandy screamed and grabbed a nearby snow shovel. She ran to Travis and began to beat him over the head. He was screaming too, a terrible high-pitched screech. He continued at Charla, unyielding. Hysterical, Sandy ran back to the house. She grabbed a butcher knife. She ran back screaming all the while as Travis stood over Charla, chewing, ripping, pulling. Sandy plunged the knife into his back. He didn't stop. She pulled the knife out and stabbed him twice more to little effect. Travis stood up finally, turned to look Sandy in the face, directly in the face then continued. Sandy ran to her Volkswagen Passat and parked about 15 feet away. She got in and locked the door. She then dialed 911, still holding the butcher knife. Time for 911, where's your emergency? Oh, this is Sandy, 241 Rock, Rock Crimmon Road. What's Send the problem? The police. Send the police. What's the problem there? The, the, the chip killed my, my friend. What's the problem with your friend? Oh. Please! What's the problem with your friend? I need to know. Get the police up! With a gun! With a Emergency medical services waited for police before approaching the house. Travis headed towards the police car when it arrived, tried to open the locked passenger door, and smashed a side view mirror. Then he went calmly around the driver's side door and opened it, at which point an officer shot him several times. Travis retreated to the house, where he was found dead next to his cage. The emergency crew described Nash's injuries as horrendous. Within the following 72 hours, Nash underwent more than seven hours of surgery on her face and hands by four teams of surgeons. The hospital provided counseling to its staff members who initially treated her because of the extraordinary nature of Nash's wounds. Paramedics noted she lost her hands, nose, eyes, lips, and mid-face bone structure and received significant brain tissue injuries. Doctors reattached her jaw, but announced on April 7, 2009, that Nash would be blind for life. Her injuries made her a possible candidate for an experimental face transplant surgery. After initial treatment at Stanford Hospital, Nash was transferred to the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. Her family started a trust fund to raise money to pay for her unfathomable medical bills. Nash revealed her damaged face in public for the first time on a morning talk show on November 11th, 2009. She was not at the time in physical pain from the attack, and family members said she hoped to leave the Cleveland Clinic soon. In June 2011, Nash underwent transplant surgery performed at the Harvard teaching affiliate Brigham and Women's Hospital. Receiving a donated face and hands, the hands transplant was initially successful, but because Nash developed pneumonia shortly thereafter, doctors were forced to remove her newly transplanted hands due to infection and resulting poor circulation. In accordance with standard procedure, Travis's head was taken to the state laboratory for a rabies test, and the body was taken to University of Connecticut for a necropsy. The head tested negative for rabies, but there was Xanax remaining in his system. The necropsy results in May 2009 confirmed the chimp was overweight and had been stabbed. Toxicology reports confirmed Sandy's statement that she had given Travis Xanax-laced tea the day of the attack, which could have exacerbated his aggression. Well, that was truly a grotesque tale. One where one pet owner didn't fully take into account the danger her pet posed on people. I think Sandy should have followed what people told her and took Travis to a shelter for other chimps. Even though Travis didn't choose to have his life among humans, this attack was something that would have happened sooner or later with this type of pet. Let us hope Charlotte Nash is doing okay. Thank you for watching the video. Subscribe, like, and share if you would also like to keep exploring our grotesque curiosity. We'll meet again in the darkness of the night.